Right now, nine games unbeaten. Mikel Arteta celebrating 100 games in charge, sixth in the Premier League table. Does it feel to you that things are starting to go in the right direction? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, you referenced the, the nine matches of, of unbeaten that we're, that we're currently on, but I think it actually started before that. Um, when I was here in August and uh, I had obviously seen the fixture list come out for the season, I knew those first three matches were going to be, be very difficult. Um, first match away um, at a ground that was going to be uh, very, let's say, just say electric for a lot of reasons. Coming out of COVID, first time in the Premier League, and then to get hit with uh, the squad having been decimated by COVID itself was always going to be a tough scenario. Then to play that into the first, or excuse me, the next two matches of uh, Chelsea and then at City, um, Champions League finalists, was always going to be a difficult run. But the group stayed together. Um, you could feel it behind the scenes. Uh, they were never fractured. They were never fragmented. And I think that that served us well in where we are right now because it really brought the group together and uh, didn't fracture us in any way. Obviously it's early days, but do you feel vindicated in the business you did in the summer and the change in profile of players that you're signing? Um, I wouldn't say vindicated by any means. Uh, I would say that I'm, I'm more driven uh, to keep pushing forward. Um, I think that whenever you start to taste a little bit of, of progress or success, even though I don't think we've had any success yet, but we are starting to feel a little bit of the progress that's been made behind the scenes, uh, it only drives me even harder. Uh, I feel that from Mikel around the training ground, I feel that around the first team squad, and I also feel it throughout the rest of the club. Um, we've been around, I've met with our commercial side, I've met with the football side, and I'm even all the way over to the women's side of the equation. Uh, FA Cup finalists got a huge match coming up next month against uh, Barcelona in the Champions League, and I think as a club we're all pulling for each other and we're all pulling in the same direction. Focusing on the men's first team, what was behind a real change in policy? You've gone from previous campaign sixth highest net spenders to the highest, in fact the highest net spenders in Europe. What was behind that? Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of answers to that question, but I think that from a collective ambition of from my father to myself, uh, to the board, to Mikel, to Edu, and on down to the rest of the football operations staff, we had a clear idea of what we needed to do with the squad. And uh, there were a lot of areas that needed to be addressed. Um, were we going to be able to address them all in one window? I, I don't think we, we did or were able to do, but we made a lot of progress in certain areas. Um, we obviously have, we have a young manager who's improving every match. I think he says that himself privately. Uh, and I think we have a squad that is really designed around his strengths and they, now they can all be in a position to grow together, challenge each other daily, and uh, when times are tough, put their arms around each other knowing that, that they're going to be back the following day um, in the foxhole, so to speak, competing with each, other's, with, e with each other's best interests at heart. Let's be honest, did you and the rest of the board, two eighth consecutive finishes mm -hmm. in the Premier League, five years since you finished in the top four, and a large number of the fans in open revolt about KSC ownership, mm -hmm. did you think this is crisis. We've got to do something about this. Um, I, I wouldn't say crisis, um, but I would say that we needed to redefine our strategy. Uh, you know, when you qualify for the Champions League as many years in a row as we did, um, it becomes expected. And to move out of those positions was uh, very um, challenging, I guess, on and off the pitch. Was um, it unacceptable? Uh, I believe so, yes. Um, as a club, when you, when you set standards and, and led by Arsene Wenger, those standards are, are very high. And we have a lot of expectations to live up to amongst our supporter and, and our fan base as a whole around the globe. And um, I think that we had to take a step back, truly understand where we were as a club, and map out a multi-year process to get back there. Uh, there were some quick fixes that we tried along the way involving, you know, breaking transfer records, um, trying to fill positions of need, but when you really examine the, the squad and the club from top to bottom, we had to redefine our culture, redefine our strategy, and we had to get younger um, on the pitch. And uh, I think from, from Hayland to some of the players that we've brought in, you're starting to see some of those players come through. Uh, you're starting to see their, their quality shine. And we have great leadership at a senior level amongst the squad well, um, where 
the senior players are really embracing the younger players, and I think that mixture is really providing some of the excitement that you see on the pitch today. As you say, it's early days, and you're not celebrating. You haven't won anything yet. Do Arsenal supporters, you reference the Vengi years, the glory years, the trophy winning years, mm -hmm. should they actually recalibrate their expectations when you're now competing alongside clubs with different models, Chelsea, Manchester City, and perhaps Newcastle United as well now, where they have vastly superior funds to you? Absolutely not. Um, I think that Arsenal fans should expect the best. That's what they've expected throughout their history and that shouldn't change at all. Um, did we have to rethink how we were going to go about achieving those goals? Absolutely. And I think that this summer really played out. Um, we weren't breaking any transfer records, but the net spend was obviously very high. We had many areas we needed to address on the pitch. Those were addressed with players of certain quality at a certain age. And um, I think that the thing that, that gets left out quite a bit is um, we needed to change a few mentalities around here. We needed to get mentally stronger. And I think that from you know, the, the new signings to the, to the kids that are coming through at Hayland um, to, again, focus on the senior players that are setting the tone in the dressing room on a daily basis, that mentality is to go out and compete and leave it all on the pitch. And I think that is a quality that can make our fans proud, win, lose, or draw. Are you convinced that the clubs I mentioned, obviously not Newcastle United in their current position in the Premier League, but the current top three or four haven't gotten away from Arsenal? Um, I think that they're in a much stronger position than we are right now because they've had uh, a chance, especially over the last several years, to really build their squads to a different place. Our strategy has changed drastically. Um, I think that you know now that the summer has settled and the players are on the pitch, um, we're, we're closing the gap slowly but surely. Uh, they have lots of resources, obviously, as you referenced. Uh, we have resources as well, and as long as we're using those resources smart, appropriately, and intelligently, um, I think that you can one plus one eventually will add up to three. You reference the fans um, in an already, you would have to admit, a fairly cool relationship between uh, Cronky Sports Entertainment and the Arsenal fans. Was the European Super League the very nadir, the lowest point? Um, in relations between the two? <laughs> Possibly. Uh, but, you know, I... I can't think of anything worse. No, I... I that I, must have been the bottom. I, I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I'll, I'll say it that way. Um, but as someone that always tries to find the positives in things, um, when you're at the bottom, there's only one way to go, and that's back up. And, you know, I, I said this to our fan advisory board that we met with last night. Um, I don't want a 48-hour period to define us. Um, we were presented with an opportunity. We asked ourselves a question, which was, what was worse, a Super League or a Super League without Arsenal? And we answered that question that we should be included in that. Were we wrong? Obviously. We listened to our fans. We made a quick pivot, removed ourselves from, from the situation. We apologized, and now we move forward. And some of the dialogue that I've had with some of the supporter groups has been as clear as crystal and I couldn't be more excited to be communicating with them on the level that I am because I understand who they are and now they're understanding who I am and I think the more we understand each other it's exciting because the only thing that we want is for Arsenal Football Club to be great. Do you think that is one of the things you've got wrong in the case you've been involved in Arsenal for over a decade and it's three years now since mm -hmm. you've had sole ownership do you think that's one of the things you have got wrong in the past is the lack of communication the lack of engagement with fans, and that has led to some of that dissatisfaction? Perhaps. Um, I really only focus on 2018 until now, because that's when I feel like we've truly controlled and owned the club, which we have. Um, since then, we've uh, been aggressive with pretty much everything that we've done in sole ownership, um, capital improvements to the training ground, breaking transfer records in the squad, um, refinancing the stadium debt, and also doing this during a time when half of the three years that we've fully owned the club has been during a global pandemic when, when revenues have been down all over the, all over the football world. Um, so I think that uh, from a fan engagement standpoint, I was already starting on those, those goals um, prior to the pandemic. And obviously whenever you get hit with something that's as unexpected as, as, as the situation that we have been through as a, as a world as a whole, um, it required my, my thoughts to be elsewhere, but 
um, coming out of the, the, the pandemic, that's a major focus of mine, and it's a major focus of the arsenal, is to get back in touch with our supporters, understand what they want, not only on the pitch, because we all want the same thing, that's to win trophies, um, but what makes them proud off the pitch? What else can we be doing in the community? Are there other areas that, that they think that we can help make them proud? Um, because some of the situations, obviously, you want to win the match on the weekend so you can brag to your friends in the canteen on a Monday. Um, but there are other situations that make the club just as proud, and that's really what keeps me going, too, because Mikhail, Edu, and everyone else is going to run the football side, but there's a massive side that's involved in the community and the foundation, and as a club, that's what we continue to push forward towards to make our fans proud on and off the pitch. Picking up on a couple of things you said there, first mm -hmm. of all, going back to the Super League, mm -hmm. when you spoke afterwards, you stopped short of saying that we will never engage in dialogue if European football is going to be discussed again. Mm -hmm. But would you say here and now, yes, potentially we could be involved in dialogue, however, we would never again make such seismic decisions without consulting our fans? Absolutely. It was, we had, uh, I mentioned it briefly a second ago, our first fan advisory board last night where we had representatives, elected representatives from several supporter groups around the table. And I think that we would be um, <laughs> naive and stupid to, to do that again without consulting our fans. Um, and they referenced certain things last night. We all referenced certain things last night of how the situation evolved. Um, but as I said, I don't want a 48-hour period to define us, and I really look forward to engaging with those supporters both now and in the future so they understand who we are and what we're trying to accomplish so we can all accomplish it together. To be honest, Josh, I don't think it was a 48-hour period that would define you. It was on the back of or during years of decline mm -hmm. under the KRC stewardship. So mm -hmm. I think it was. that's why I said mm -hmm. it's at the very bottom. So you're coming from a long way back. One of the things that the supporters want, which may well be included in Tracy Crouch's fan-led review, which we get the results in a few weeks' time as well, is the possibility of fan representation on the board or the so-called golden chair. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you would engage in or be an advocate of? Um, it's hard for me to comment on Tracy Crouch's review without seeing the final version of it. Well, she but... published an interim where mm -hmm. it was indicated that that may well be in there. Mm -hmm. And I know it's something that the Arsenal supporters trust want as well. It's, I, the only way I can answer that question is it's difficult for me to comment on it without knowing how everything will wind up. Um, if there's independent regulators and they come in and they offer up certain suggestions for how clubs should be run, um, we'll obviously embrace them and, and work with them. Um, but until that point in time, it's difficult to say. In terms of um, the other interested parties, as, as you're well aware. Can you bring us up to speed on Daniel Eck in particular? Have bids been made and is there current dialogue? Um, uh, we get uh, bids for the club all the time um, from many different parties around the world uh, and that speaks to the strength of, of the Arsenal. I mean it's a wonderful institution. Arsenal Football Club is a global brand and uh, my only response to anything really is the club is not for sale. We're just getting started. Thierry Henry, who obviously is associated with that bid, said, we are not going away. What's your response? Um, I don't really have a response um, other than to say simply the club is not for sale. We're, we're just getting started. We've only really owned the club since 2018. Um, we have a young manager, we have a young squad, and we're just charting our path for the future. Um, in the United States, uh, we have a certain model, and we're implementing that here, and we have over the last three years, which is um, young players, talented players with the right mentality, let them grow together while continuing to, to sprinkle in talent throughout uh, the squad and eventually it grows into something that's very special. Uh, the power of continuity behind the scenes and people working together and pulling in the same direction I think is, a, is an underrated aspect, aspect of pro sports and uh, I think that with the power of continuity and allowing this group to grow together, special times are ahead for the club. When you say that you have a similar model elsewhere, obviously you have interest in other sports mm -hmm. as well. How does Arsenal compare? And what you, you can obviously take some parts from a business and transfer it. How is it similar and how is it different to other sports that you're involved in? Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots of similarities and there's lots of differences. Um, 
I say it's like it's it's fruit to fruit. It's but it's it's apples to watermelons, um, and uh, there's there's no brand and there's no club and there's no exposure um, anywhere in our businesses like Arsenal Football Club. Um, it's a global brand. It's consumed by fans all over the world, every continent, um, in every space. You see it popping up on social media, and uh, I think that when you try to compare certain things. Like I said, it's fruit to fruit, but the leagues are different, the sports are different, but a lot of the business is the same. And you're trying to drive revenues, you're trying to please fans, and you're trying to win games. And how do you do that? Every sport is slightly different, um, but there are lessons that you can apply um, and different psychologies that you can apply across your organizations to try to create that continuity that we've talked about. Good start is winning trophies, isn't it? It is, without a <laughs> doubt. You're only as good as your last match, and uh, you know, Having a little bit of silverware behind you never hurts. How much of a fan are you? Be honest. And look, let's be honest. You were a basketball player as a young man, mm -hmm. and that was your sport. Did you play football? I did. What position were you? I was a right winger. Any good? Uh, I was good enough to be the, I think I was the second leading scorer, but only because our left winger was our best player. And being tall, um, I was usually on the back post heading in most of his crosses. So it, was, it worked out fairly well for me. If you were to um, describe, describe yourself or compare yourself to a player, who would it be? It doesn't have to be current. Who, oh, did you, who did you model your game on? Who did I model my game on? I, I wouldn't even know where to compare. I, uh, as you said, I was a basketball player and so um, focusing on basketball when I was 15, 16 years old became kind of what I wanted to do and I started to grow. Um, but I don't know, I'd have to really think about that, who I would have modeled. Who were you similar to as a player? Who was I similar to? I mean, I was tall and skinny, so... Well, Peter, well, Peter Crouch wasn't Peter, really a winger. Yeah, so I was going to, I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to say you, that. Mind you, if you were back post. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the back post and I did score a lot of goals with my head. Um, so let me think, I mean, gosh, I don't, I've, been, I've never been asked that question before, so it's hard, it's hard to think All through right, that you can, one. you can come back to no, me I'll come back to <laughs> You, you focus on the, the three years you've been in sole charge. I will say this, as I continue to grow and, and mature, I probably would have turned into a more of a, an aggressive central defender knowing how my personality was, as, as opposed to a winger. Oh, so you turn into per with, murder sacker. With, I would, probably would have been more of a per murder sacker <laughs> than I would have been uh, up front of it and being any, any sort of Thierry Henry. <laughs> <laughs> um, best moment since you've been at the club, and you've had many difficult times. But when you're in the director's box, as you say, you're a fan. Mm -hmm. Most enjoyable moment? Um, I mean, I would have to say that the FA Cups uh, come, to, come to the top of my mind. Um, even though I wasn't physically here, uh, it was very rewarding to see Mikel uh, win the FA Cup during, um, during the COVID times. I wasn't physically able to be here because of all of the, the COVID protocols at the time, but um, any kind of silverware that you went along the way, whether it was an FA Cup under Arsene, a Community Shield, or the FA Cup under, under Mikel, um, but they're, you know, I mean, Spurs wins. I mean, I think those jump to the top of the plate. Uh, anytime that you see the Emirates boisterous, rocking, and fans chanting the way they can, which is why the last several matches have been so wonderful for me to see, because you can see the supporters really getting behind the current group of players in a way that I'm not sure they have been for a few years. Well, that's happening right now. But what's it like for you to hear the boos in the stadium, see the banners cronky out, and the hashtags cronky out? Uh, doesn't feel good, <laughs> um, but uh, I've been through a lot. As a young man, I was, um, as you said, I was a basketball player. Um, you hear lots of things um, being out there on the court, especially coming from... Do you think it helps the fact you're an ex-sportsman yourself? Uh, potentially. Um, my dad and I joke that we have to wear a rhinoceros hide at times, and um, that's, that's the case at, at, at points in time with Arsenal. Um, as with our other, cl other clubs in the United States as well. I mean, uh, the best and, and sometimes worst part about professional sports is the passion behind the scenes, and that goes both ways. You, want, you have to have that passion because you want those supporters out there supporting the group on the field, um, but that passion can go both ways. And I understand that, I embrace that, and usually when things are going well, the focus is rightfully so. It's on the coach and the players on the pitch, and when things are going poorly, I think people look to, to the decision makers to make changes. And so if all the focus is on the players and, and, and the coaches, things are going well, and I'm usually blended into the background just cheering and being a fan. 
You said uh, the last time you spoke publicly that it's on you and the rest of the board to drive this club forward. How much do you feel that you'll be able to turn around in two, three years' time and say, yeah, we delivered? Um, growing more confident by the day, but there's a lot of work ahead. Uh, even though we're starting to show signs of progress, um, if you don't keep pushing forward, you'll stagnate. And I think that's a, a big focus of ours right now is what are our next steps? Um, do we feel good about where we are? We feel better about where we are. We don't feel good. Um, our fans still deserve, deserve more. We, we need to get back in the top four. We need to start qualifying for the Champions League regularly. And with that, um, Champions League qualification also comes um, a different level of, of how you can recruit players. The best players want to play in the best league in the world, which is the Champions League, outside of the Premier League. And uh, once you start competing consistently for the Premier League trophy, you're pretty much competing for the rest of the, the trophies in the sport. And so our goal is to win the Premier League. And once, once we're in the conversation for the Premier League, um, I think that's when interesting things will really start to happen elsewhere as well. How important is it, and is it having learned from mistakes that you've made, that in this journey now, you get the fans on board who will not easily be bought with uh, PR sound bites or what they perceive as hollow gestures, mm -hmm. that you get them to believe in your stewardship and that you are taking this, play, this club to the right place? Um, I think the only way to win any kind of skeptics over is with um, time and effort. Um, hopefully, as I said, they're starting to see the direction on the pitch, um, but there's many other places I want to make them proud as well. It starts with, with the men's first team, um, but we have, our, we have our women's, we have our U23s, we have our academy, and there's so much that goes on behind the scenes at the Arsenal that um, I want to make sure we're addressing everything in addition to trying to compete for the biggest trophies in Europe. Um, there was a recent um, story that ran, I saw it come across my uh, Twitter feed, um, you know, involving a, a young fan that came to the Emirates for the first time with autism. Um, you know, he, he was, became overwhelmed, tried to leave, and fortunately as a club we have wonderful people working, working game nights that saw the situation unfold, asked a question, and were able to create, uh, turn a negative into an immense positive thing. And hopefully that's something that Arsenal fans can get behind as a whole because even though it wasn't directly what was happening on the pitch, it's something that can make them incredibly proud to be a part of the Arsenal Football Club. I saw that story and it was a fantastic story. But I have to say as a club owner, you're rather very brave or foolish reading Twitter. Uh, I, as, as I said, I, <laughs> I scroll. I don't, I don't read much. Um, I skim the headlines to understand what the narratives are out there, but I don't really, really read anything. I think um, if I start to read uh, too much, my, my judgment can be affected by people who might not have our best interests at heart. And so I understand what narratives, or certain narratives are out there, but I keep my head down, keep my ears closed, and just try to keep plowing forward. Is that harder to find the balance? Because as you said yourself, when you had the meeting in April mm -hmm. post Super League, I promise we will be engaging with you guys, meaning the fans, a lot more and we will be listening to you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be hearing things you may not necessarily want to hear, but these are your loyal fan base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I understand that. And part of, part of that is, is, you know, am I ready to hear very honest and open communication from them? And, and, and I am, I have been. And does that mean that it's always going to be positive? Obviously not, um, but if I can separate emotion from what they're telling me and embrace what they're telling me, knowing that it, the emotion's coming from a good place, I think that can lead us as a club to a very special environment where I'm not saying that they'll ever fully embrace myself, my father, or our stewardship, um, but as long as they're behind those, those guys on the pitch and we're all pulling in the same direction, uniting the Arsenal fan base globally behind a squad is, is something that, that I want to achieve because um, I think it can be a very powerful thing for, for the players and especially for a young squad and a young manager like Mikel.